Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well today. I want to thank you so much for joining me for this podcast. And I'm doing just a little bit of an intro here before I get to the main part of our time together today. And uh, to let you know what this is about, I'm, I'm doing uh, an interview with the two co-producers of an upcoming documentary entitled Cessationist. I was interviewed for this documentary, as was Jim Osmond. You'll see him in the, in the, uh, as we get into the meat of the matter here. Uh, as was Conrad Mbewe, Phil Johnson, Gabe Hughes, uh, a number of other men, very solid, Joel Beakey, doctrinally solid men. Uh, Josh Bice was as well, uh, a number of a number of folks. I shouldn't start naming them because I'll forget some. But at any rate, this is a, a really exciting project, and I'm honored to be a part of it. It will be, I believe, a tour de force for the biblical position of cessationism. And uh, I want to let you know about it. And up front here on the on the beginning part, to ask for your support. Uh, there's a lot, a lot that goes into making a documentary and uh, a lot of expenses. And those of you who have followed my channel for any amount of time, you know that I have never asked for money for myself or for my ministry uh, on my YouTube channel. Not once have I done that. Uh, there's just been two or three videos where I've asked some people to support to support a worthy cause, a family who lost their their um, father and, and husband some months ago and uh the writing project of conrad and bayway in africa and the work they're doing so um but i've never asked for money for myself and i'm still not here uh, but i i would like to ask for your support for this uh documentary cessationist there is a kickstarter program underway right now and the link to that is down below there in the description so um Anyway, I, I, I mentioned the Kickstarter program in this episode, but it's towards the end of the video. And so I, I know a lot of people will start watching it and they never finish it. So at any rate, um, please watch this interview. And if after watching the interview, this is something that you would, would like to support, it would uh, be greatly, greatly appreciated. My ministry has supported this. Not a dime of this is going to me. In fact, this is outflow from my ministry too to this project because I do believe, I really believe that this will be a tremendous tool and by God's grace, it will be one that he will use in the lives of many people for many years to come. So, all right, dear ones, uh, with that, by way of introduction, let's go to the interview. And it is my privilege today to introduce you or if not introduce you necessarily, give you a little bit more information about this new documentary entitled Cessationist. I'm really excited about this, and I am joined today by David Lovey and Tim Cannon, who are brothers. Tell me your your titles. You're the is related to the documentary. Right now, we're the co-producers of the film. Co-producers. Uh, okay. Yeah, we're still we're, we're still working working out all the titles for it, though. Okay. All right. So the co-producers of the film. And also Jim Osmond, uh, my friend and pastor of Kootenai Community Church in Sandpoint, Idaho. So David and Tim interviewed Jim and myself for this documentary, Cessationist, as well as a number of other names that you are likely familiar with. Phil Johnson, Conrad Mbewe, a number of others. Um, we'll talk some more about that. But I, wanna, I want you to hear from, from David and from Tim, and they're going to tell us more about this documentary. Uh, what they're going to do with it, uh, when's it going to come out, all this kind of stuff. So David, Tim, Jim as well, thank you, brothers, for joining me. Yeah, you're very welcome. Thanks for having us. Thank right. you so much for having us. Yeah. Yeah. So well, we wanted to make – uh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Take it away. Uh, well, actually, you know what, Tim, if you would like to talk, talk about – uh, what we were originally going to do before we started making this film. Yeah. So, so um, real briefly, I, I met David at together for the gospel 2018 when he worked for the Martin Lloyd Jones uh, uh, trust board. And uh, he had yeah. just come off the heels of working on logic on fire, the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. And uh, I kind of became friends with him. We hit it off and I said, Hey, I just kept hounding him. We need to make another movie. 
And he said, okay, what do you want to make a movie about? And it turns out we were going to make a film about Beth and Lloyd Jones, the wife of the doctor. Uh, and it would be a sort of sequel. And with COVID, it kind of put everything to a halt with travel. Everything was locked down in uh, Wales and Scotland and England. So we kind of had to regroup and we said, well, what do we want to make a film about? And we picked the highly controversial topic of cessationism. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, good choice. Uh, mm -hmm. Cause this is, uh, this is an issue. It's you're kind of behind the eight ball a little bit in a sense, just with the name because cessationist has kind of a, you know, I guess kind of a, a, a down sounding name, you know, something is ceased and, but, uh, but once we talk about what it really is and, and what it means uh, in people's lives, their sanctification, I think this will be a tremendously impactful documentary. I'm very excited about it. I think it'll be a great help to a lot of people. And um, David, what, what would you like to share with our viewers about, about this film? Yeah. So I first became um, interested in pneumatology. I mean, obviously, as, as a Christian, we, we have to be interested in pneumatology or the study of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. um, but I became really interested in this topic after I became a pastor of an evangelical free church north of Chicago, about 40 miles north of Chicago. And uh, actually, right when I first became the pastor, I uh, started a a book club. We called it the Brown Bag Book Club. And I, I wanted to introduce the people in the church to great works in church history. So we started reading uh, J.C. Ryle's Old Paths and, and F.W. Krumacher's The Suffering Savior. And we read uh, uh, Thomas Boston's Human Nature and Its Fourfold State. And all with a group of mostly retired people uh, who, who are not typically the, the demographic you would think that that would be interested in, you know, learning about really deep theological issues, but boy, they really loved it. Well, when I had the idea to start that book club, there was a lady in the church who came up to me and, and asked, when are we going to read Good Morning, Holy Spirit by mm -hmm. Benny Hinn? And I I thought at first I thought she was just joking, but but she wasn't. And and uh, then I realized with some of the song choices that the church had been making prior to me getting there, too, that they were playing Hillsong and Bethel music and Jesus culture and all of that. And and I became a Christian relatively later on in my life when, when, I, when I was 22 years old. So I didn't have much experience with those kind of contemporary Christian music. I thought it was all just kind of corny sounding, honestly. Yeah. Um, but then when I started listening to, to the lyrics of those songs and saying something is really off with this music and a lady in the church came up to me uh, very soon after I became the pastor there. And she gave me this thick packet of uh, information she had gathered about Hillsong, Jesus Culture, Bill Johnson, who I'd never heard of before, um, and, and saying how her daughter was sucked in by that music into uh, Bethel Church. And she, she left Chicago, moved to California to join that, um, to join that church. Yeah. And it's that, that experience of reading what this faithful lady had compiled about like, actually, this is not just a difference of uh, minor, minor theological issue. This, this is a different, a different person. It, it, they're, they're talking about a different person than the Bible describes as who the Holy Spirit is. And, um, and it set me on the path to really dig deep and, and study these things. And um, I had, gone into being a pastor as a kind of an open but cautious um, person when it came to the uh, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. Like, I don't, I don't know. I don't want to limit God. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I but I don't know if, if what is uh, what calls itself tongues or or the gift of healing is really real or not. I'm just I'm just cautious about it. And the reason why is because I felt like I didn't want to limit God. 
Um, but as I dug into pneumatology deeper and, and read some books on the subject um, and started doing Bible study on the subject, I realized uh, actually that the charismatic position uh, on the gifts, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit is, is just not bearing out with facts today, right. that the, those, those things that they claim are actually going on in the church aren't really going on in the church. And the reason is because those were the signs of apostles and there are no more apostles today. And so it, it set me on a journey to, uh, to really become serious about pneumatology. And when, when the project fell through, um, the far above rubies, the life of Beth and Lloyd Jones, which we hope to still make someday, because that, that's actually a worthy film, I, I think needs to be made. Um, but when that fell through and Tim and I were talking about oh, what else could we do immediately, I think at the same time, both of us thought, what, what, what if we made a film about biblical pneumatology? What does the Bible, what if we made a positive case for the doctrine of cessationism, both yeah. historically and biblically, because I, I think a, a common theme we've seen since we dropped our Kickstarter is people saying there are absolutely no arguments for the cessation of the miraculous gifts. Yeah. And that's simply not, not true. No. Um, so, so our, our film is going to be focused not as much on what, what we've heard as a critique of the, the low hanging fruit of the, of false teachers. Although we will talk about that because um, that, like you said uh, in the trailer that, that we dropped, that is the mainstream of the charismatic movement that's out there. Um, Without a doubt. But we also want to truly interact with the arguments of people like Sam Storms and D.A. Carson and John Piper um, and, and so on, uh, uh, continue, and Wayne Grudem, continuationists today that though I respect those brothers, and I think that they are brothers, they are in the fringe of the charismatic movement. But we want to we want to really interact with their arguments and show why we don't believe that they're real or true uh, or, or, or even uh, biblically accurate. Right. And that, you know, that's why we wanted to get you two guys in the movie. Yeah. Well, uh, I think I speak for Jim when I say we're both honored to be a part of it, excited about yeah. the project. And Jim, uh, one of the one of the common misconceptions that I hear all the time from my charismatic critics is that, oh, you're a cessationist. You don't believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't believe in the gifts. That's they just said you don't believe in the gifts. So maybe give us a, a definition of what is cessationism actually and what is it not? Yeah, F Phil Johnson addresses <clears throat> this in the video, actually, uh, as he describes what cessationism is. It, it's, a, it's a narrow view of the cessation of some of the miraculous or apostolic gifts. So that would be the gift of tongues, the gift of interpretation of tongues, the gift of miracles and healing, um, the gift of prophecy in its uh, foretelling or revelation revelatory sense, not in its proclaiming or teaching sense, but in its foretelling or revelatory sense, and probably um, the gift of, uh, of um, I mentioned interpretation of tongues already. So th those more miraculous and revelatory gifts of the New Testament. And of course, we would say that those signs were given to the apostles as an authentication of the ministry. They were signs of an apostle. Paul calls, uh, Paul speaks of the signs of an apostle in, in his letter to the Corinthians. So we just simply believe that those gifts given to in the apostolic age for the purpose of authenticating the, the recipients of divine revelation, that those gifts are no longer given by the Holy Spirit. That's the cessationist perspective. And, and as, um, as, as most cessationists will point out, anybody who is within evangelicalism who believes that the Bible is the word of God and, the, and that the canon is closed is really a cessationist. Because we're arguing the scripture is no longer being given. We're arguing that there's no, more, no longer an apostolic office, that the gift of apostle is not being given. And all of us have to recognize that the things being done in the New Testament are just not taking place today. And so even some of our reformed or uh, cautious, but um, what do you call it? Uh, open, open, but cautious. Cautious, open but cautious brethren. Even they would say, well, th these gifts that are being manifested today 
are the same gift, but a different manifestation of the gift. And so even like, for instance, Wayne Grudem would say that the gift of prophecy today is not the same gift as it happened in the New Testament. It's not a, it's not a revelatory gift. It's a, it's a personal gift. It's not, um, it's not inspired, inerrant, and authoritative in the way the scripture is. So really what he's arguing is the, is the cessationist perspective. He, he's admitting that what happened in the New Testament is not happening today. That's, that's basically the cessationist argument. We don't believe that scripture is being given today, that it's being written today. And therefore, unless you believe that there's an open canon and that we should be adding books of scripture, like Jesus calling and Jesus calling to and Jesus calling for doctors and Jesus calling, but I was busy, all of those books to the end of the New Testament and calling those revelation, unless you're going to argue for that, then you're really arguing for a cessationist perspective. So everybody who believes that they're hearing from God today would say, uh, yeah, I hear from God, but it's not inerrant and fallible and authoritative. In which case, they're, what they're really saying is, yeah, I think these gifts are still kind of given, but they're not the same as the New Testament. And so then the different, you're, you're really arguing the heart of the cessationist perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so it's like, when I hear people say this, uh, I always say, <clears throat> excuse me, I think even Michael Brown, um, Michael Brown has said that he no longer, that he doesn't believe that there are capital A apostles today. I, I I don't know. He's kind of equivocated on that, but, but anybody who would say, okay, we don't have apostles today. Like, like John was like Peter was uh, like Paul was okay. We don't have those apostles. Uh, okay. Well, if, if, if you yep. believe that, then congratulations, you're a cessationist. Yeah. You believe the gift of apostle has ceased. It's no longer given. Right. And so we're simply saying that the spirit is sovereign over the giving of those gifts and he gives the gifts according to his will. And if it is his will to give a certain grouping of gifts, revelatory gifts for a specific period of time, and then not give those gifts anymore, that's all the cessationist is arguing is that we're basically saying the spirit of God is sovereign. He gives the gifts according to his purpose. And we're saying that those gifts have a purpose. That purpose has been fulfilled. And today we are the beneficiaries of that work of those gifts in the early church. And they're no longer necessary or needful. And therefore they're no longer given. Yeah, that's right. Right. Because th there were gaps even in the Bible of the miraculous for hundreds and hundreds of years, right? Between oh, yeah. Moses and Elijah and Elijah to the New Testament. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not like a gap in the miraculous is something strange that right. seems like the miraculous periods themselves were only very, very temporary each time. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, and that's even exactly in the New right. Testament era, what you see is that in the New Testament, the, the miracles that took place and the revelatory ministry of the Spirit that took place took place under the ministry and in connection to the ministry of the apostles. Your yeah. average everyday Christian was not writing scripture. Right. Luke wrote in connection with Paul's ministry. Mark wrote in connection with uh, Peter's ministry. And then you have John and Peter and Paul and James uh, James even himself writing in connection with apostolic ministry. So these books were written under the auspices of the apostles and the miracles were done by those who were either apostles or those closely associated with apostolic ministry, namely Philip and Barnabas and the men who were, who were tied to the apostles. So there, there's no sense, there's right. no justification in scripture that your average run of the mill Christian uh, woke up and was able to do miracles and see miracles in their day-to-day -day life. And that these healings were going on all over the place, widespread in the early church. That's just not the record of the new Testament. That's right. And I'm uh, Acts five twelve to your point, Jim, it says now at the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were happening among the people. So, yep. I mean, that right there. So signs and, and Luke is consistent. You read through the book of Acts, you'll see him use that same formula time and again. At the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were taking place. Paul and Barnabas testified of what God did through them. It, it, it's specific. Luke's argument all the way through the gospel of Acts is that these men, particularly Paul and Barnabas, were designated as authentic spokesmen for Jesus Christ because they had the ability to do the same miracles that Jesus Christ did. And so yeah. now today we have no need for those same gifts to be given. That's right. That's right. And as but, but that's not to say, Justin, to get back to your question, that's yeah. not to say that God does not do miracles today or that God does not heal today or that's that right. the spirit of God is not active today because you know, th this is the danger that charismatics have. They have at the same time, a very over-realized and under-realized pneumatology. 
Hmm. It's over-realized in the sense that everything to them is a miracle, right? If I pray for something and God provided it by providence, that's a miracle. So that's the spirit of God. And every whisper, every nudging, every prompting, every random thought that pops into their head, that's the spirit of God. It must be God speaking. So that's an over-realized pneumatology. But at the same time, when you take away all of those things and say, no, the spirit of God is not speaking to you, then they demonstrate that they have a very under-realized pneumatology. And they say, well, what then do you think the spirit of God does? And as cessationists, we would say the spirit of God is involved in dozens of ways in everything that we do. He's working out providence. He's the, he, he regenerates, he sanctifies, he encourages, he strengthens, he emboldens, he works through his word. He helps preachers preach. He gives gifts to the body. He's working through the gifts of administration. The spirit of God is constantly active in our lives, but charismatics can't see any of that. All they, if, the, if they don't see a miraculous thing, they think the spirit of God is not there. And if you tell them the spirit of God is not doing any of these radical signs, then, then they just say, well, what then do you think the spirit of God does? Which shows yeah. you just how pathetic their view of the Holy Spirit is that, that they don't see the spirit of God at work in, in almost any way, unless it's some supernatural spectacular thing that's supposed to, you know, be, be very sensational. That's, that's their view of the Holy Spirit. He's just the one who pops up and does crazy things. And if he's not doing crazy things, he's not doing anything. Yeah. Bingo. Bingo. Yeah, I tell yeah. people as a cessationist, I see no ground to the charismatics in my pneumatology, in my view of the Holy Spirit. I, it is, yeah. I, we would all argue, and I think will be argued in this documentary, that it is not we cessationists who have a low view of the Holy Spirit. It's charismatics. It's, it's word faith, New Apostolic Reformation folks who have a low view of the Holy Spirit of God. And, and that is ground, that is theological ground that, would, that, that we need to reclaim. And I, I hope this, by God's grace, this documentary will help us to reclaim. Well, if, if you if you juxtapose this documentary with what came out a couple of years ago, I believe it's called Holy Ghost. Uh, yeah. with, I think the guy's name is Darren something. They, I, yeah. I saw it. And I actually recently rewatched the trailer. Uh, and he says in the trailer, you know, we're going to make God famous. And it's just Todd White, you know, going to porn <laughs> concerts, late, lengthening people's legs. And frankly, that, that documentary was appalling. So this will be the complete opposite of anything you saw in that film which I don't recommend people will see. Yeah. Cause yeah. I think God is just thinking himself. I really need a good PR agent to make me famous. If I could just get <laughs> some good press, I could, really, right. I could conquer the world. Poor old God. I mean, all he did was speak the universe into existence, redeem, redeem mankind. But uh, boy, he, he needs just, our help. He really does. I'm so he glad. Todd White. <laughs> what? Yeah. He needs Todd White. Yeah. He needs Todd White. <laughs> yeah. He needs Todd. <laughs> I tell you what, yeah. If your view of the Holy Spirit is is Todd White's leg lengthening stick and uh, angel feathers and gold dust falling out of the sky, then uh, I'm sorry, um, you're you're you have a much lower view of the Holy Spirit than do I. Mm -hmm. That's something else that we really want to. Sorry, my Tim gave me this cat the other day, <laughs> and the cat has been making so much noise during our call i had to pick her up and pet her otherwise she would have been interrupting us the whole yes, time yes the demon out of that cat brother <laughs> her, her, her name is pickles she's a cessationist okay her name is legion and <laughs> uh, so, but our, our, our film uh, i think i think it's important to 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 know that our, our film is making a positive case yes. about not just what the Holy Spirit isn't doing, but what he is doing. He is doing. And he, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness. And he's the one who opened Lydia's heart to pay attention to the word in Acts 16. He's the one that opened the Philippian jailer's heart in the same chapter to yeah. cry out, what must I do to be saved? And he is regenerating souls and he is guiding us in the paths of righteousness through the word, through the application of the word, through the preaching of the word and taking the word and applying it to the listener's hearts who are hearing it. Yeah. And the Holy, like you guys were just saying that the Holy Spirit is very much at work today. Um, it, it's interesting as we've been posting on social media, our, our Kickstarter, we've gotten so many replies from people saying, you know, why don't you just go one step further and call yourself atheists? Because you're, you're saying that God isn't at work. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying 
God is at work, just not in the way the charismatics are saying that he is. He's yeah. at work in, in a, doing a much greater miracle, actually, now, even than things like the healing at the gate called beautiful, as, as wonderful as that was. In silver and gold, I do not have, but what I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. As wonderful and marvelous as that was, the, the real miracle that was happening there was the change in the man's heart. It, from from being an unbeliever to being a follower of Jesus, that is yeah. is far, far more beautiful and precious. Yeah. And um, I, I was wondering if you guys m- might just briefly address um, tongues, because I, I think that's probably the way that most modern uh, continuationists see um the the continue you know what, what what they believe is is the continuation of the holy spirit's miraculous gift today in the gift of tongues so obviously there's pentecostals who believe that if you don't speak in tongues then you're not even a christian um yeah. one, one of the things I, I, and then i'll be quiet because i want to hear from you guys but one of the things that really set me down the path of cessationism um was a sermon that I heard from John MacArthur, where he talks about Isaiah chapter 28, where right. the Lord s- speaks to Isaiah and says, I will speak to this people through strange lips and a foreign tongue. At, and that's as a sign of judgment on Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And then we see that very thing happen in Acts chapter two. And then in Acts, I mean, in first Corinthians 14, Paul quotes that verse yeah, and he and he's saying this is a sign not for believers but for unbelievers because what what the sign was was that because of the rejection of the Jewish leadership of their Messiah the gospel is now going to every tongue and the Lord is going to to uh, proclaim His glory through every other language other than Hebrew as well as Hebrew too um, so if could you guys maybe talk a little bit about that why why does why, why, why did people get the idea that tongues were some kind of gibberish language? Or where did that come from? Jim, if you want to start, you can offer some thoughts. And then if yeah, um, the, I have the any New myself, Testament, I'll... Yeah, in the New Testament, the word for tongues is the word for languages. And it should be translated languages. So even the continuations today would say that what happens today with the gift of tongues is a private prayer language that should be. Uh, spoken in your prayer closet or in in the service and it's really our own individual communication with god that we're speaking to him in a language that only he knows and yet that what goes off at what, what passes for tongues today in most charismatic circles doesn't even have any of the any of the hallmarks of a language it doesn't have a recognizable uh, structure to the language or syntax or anything like that it's 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 not a human language at all they say it's an angelic language and yet the new testament describes it as a human language in acts chapter 2 those people who were gathered at pentecost heard the gospel being preached every one of them in their own dialectos the word for dialect so it wasn't just the word for languages they heard their language and an individual dialect that they were understanding so that they were able to communicate. And it was not, it was not a miracle of the hearing. It's not that Peter was speaking in Hebrew and the people were hearing it in, in the uh, Egyptian language or the Ethiopian language. It's that Peter stood up and whatever his language ability was at that moment, he was able to speak in a language he had never learned and never known. But in that moment, the, the Holy Spirit gave him the ability to communicate the gospel in a human language to people who are there. So, I would say I would I would like to find the I would like to know which charismatic is able to go to a foreign tribe who is completely isolated from the gospel and has no written language in and able to just without any training at all step in off the plane into that tribe and preach the gospel in the native tongue of those people. Show me that gift of tongues. That's yeah. the New Testament gift of tongues. And in the in the early church, it operated as a sign to the Jews, a sign of judgment, as you mentioned, because a Jew hearing foreign languages in their on their native soil was always a sign of God's judgment. It meant that they were under the dominion of some other foreign power, Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, whatever it was. 
they would hear these languages on their own soil. And it was always a reminder that we are under the judgment of God. We don't rule ourselves because we have been disobedient to God. And so God has brought in conquerors to come in and to conquer us. So if you were walking through the streets of Jerusalem and you heard Roman soldiers speaking the Greek language, it was always in your mind a reminder of the prophecy from Isaiah that we are under judgment because God is judging us for our sin. Therefore, it was a sign of judgment, not a personal prayer language. So the continuationist has to argue that it's a personal prayer language, and they're really arguing that the, the method of, has changed, that God no longer gives the gift of tongues as a human language today, but instead he gives it as a prayer language. Well, you're conceding the heart of the cessationist argument when you make that claim as a continuationist. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and to your point, it's interesting when you look at the history of the Pentecostal movement, I mean, you can go back to uh, uh, Alexander Dowie and then later uh, Charles Fox Parham and William Seymour, but with Parham especially uh, back at the turn of the 20th century. So the first few years of the 1900s, um, he actually, with all, all the other problems, theological problems that he had notwithstanding, but he he believed, rightly so, that the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues was actually that, a gift of languages, known human languages. It was the gift of someone to be able to speak in a language, known language, it just was not known to him. In other words, like, if I could all of a sudden speak fluent Swahili, that is yeah. a known language, it's just not known to me. And th so that was his understanding of tongues, and, and he was right about that. And so it's interesting when you read their history, his group uh, sent off a group of people to three different countries, China, India, and Japan, without having taught them any of the languages. They just, they believe that once these folks got on the boats and sailed across the ocean blue and got to these different countries, that they would step off the boat and God would give them the gift of tongues, the gift of languages, and they would be able to communicate to people in Chinese, Japanese, and um, whatever dialect of Indian they happen to land to. Problem is, <laughs> they, they made it across the ocean, all right. But once they got there and they stepped off the ships, they quickly realized, they can't, I can't understand these people and they can't understand me. And so they, they got back on the ships. They came back to the United States completely dejected. It didn't work. And it was only then that uh, Pentecostal said, oh, oh, wait a minute, sorry. We got this wrong. Okay, it's the gift of tongues is not speaking in a known language. It's actually speaking in unintelligible ecstatic gibberish. So when they came back in complete failure, realizing that this didn't work, then and only then they say, oh, okay, it's it's not speaking in Swahili or German or Portuguese. No, it's, it's speaking this gibberish. And that has been the accepted charismatic belief for the last 120 years almost. Yeah. Well, right. So this is a relatively new phenomenon then when it when it comes to tongues being considered uh, gibberish kind of heavenly language. So could you yeah. guys maybe briefly address then what does Paul mean when he says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels? Yeah, um, Jim, I, I mean, ahead, I can Christine. answer this, but I'll let you, yeah. you want me to. Go ahead. Well, well, Paul is using hyperbole. He's exaggerating to make a point. And this is one of the key texts. Let me, let me pull it up here on my phone. This is one of the key texts that charismatics all go to, uh, to support their belief that the gift of tongues is speaking in, in an angelic language, you know, a, a language that only that we don't understand, but angels understand because you're speaking with the tongues of angels. He says, so first Corinthians 13, one, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become as a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. That's actually an important reference here. A lot of people kind of glance over that. But then he goes on in verse two. He says, if I have the gift of prophecy, know all mysteries, all knowledge. Well, did Paul have all knowledge? No. Did he, did he know all mysteries? No. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, had Paul ever rearranged the topography of Israel? No. <laughs> No, he's, he's exaggerating to make a point. He's using hyperbole, but do not have love. I am nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, had Paul done this? No, we know he was a tent maker. If I surrender my body to be burned, had Paul surrendered his body to be burned? No, 
but do not have love, it profits me nothing. So Paul's exaggerating to make a point. Paul is, this is actually a, re, a rebuke to the Corinthians. The Corinthians in Paul's absence had become very arrogant in their exercise of the spiritual gifts and what they thought they could do and what the, they thought they knew and what they could do. And so they became very arrogant. And Paul's writing a corrective, a rebuke to them saying, look, even if I could, if I knew all mysteries, had all knowledge, even if I could remove mountains, even if I could speak with the tongues of angels, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. And you see the Corinthians were all arrogant about what they thought they could do and what they thought they knew, but they did not have love. They had no true biblical love. And Paul is correcting them, rebuking them. He says, it profits me nothing. And that reference, uh, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal, this was a very pointed reference because before the Corinthians heard the gospel, before they were converted to Christ in their pagan worship, in their pagan days, they used noisy gongs, clanging cymbals as part of their pagan worship. And part of their pagan worship was, guess what? To speak in unintelligible, ecstatic gibberish. Mm -hmm. Same thing that charismatics do today, and they call it the gift of tongues. So there, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but And also, <laughs> when Paul says, when I speak with the tongues of angels, you'll hear charismatics say, oh, when you pray in tongues, that you're praying in a language that Satan does not understand because you're praying in the tongues of angels and Satan doesn't understand the tongues of angels. So you're praying in a language, you kind of slip one in under old Lucifer there. Well, wasn't because, he an angel? Bingo. <laughs> That's what Satan is. He's an angel. He's a fallen angel, but he's an angel. So I tell people, if you want to pray in a language that Satan does not understand, then the tongues of angels would be the last language <laughs> I would recommend you praying in. That's that's what he is. So you know, it's a linguistic equivalent of uh, you know, uh, Brer Rabbit. Don't throw me in that briar patch. You know, don't don't throw me in that briar patch because that's could exactly. I, what it is. Could I add um, to kind of go back a story that Jim actually told me uh, about a couple at his church who were missionaries uh, to what was the Manhui people. Um, yeah. and yeah. the fact that they spent what, seven years learning the language before they could even properly share the gospel with the, that tribe. And I was blown away by that story that it wasn't yeah. just, they, they showed up and then all of a sudden they're speaking Manhui or they're hearing in Manhui, you know, it, I was blown. I mean, seven years, that's almost a decade. That's, that's a very long time to be patient, to, to trust the Lord in, in that. Yeah, and Tim, they, they, they did that just to learn the language so that they could create for that tribe a written language because this tribe had no written language. So they had to create the written language, create the alphabet for it, create the words for them, and then, and then begin to teach them to read the written part of their language so that they could read scripture. And that whole project was a, a, almost a four-decade project that they were involved in, and the story is incredible. Um, and, and I think a proof that God is not giving that gift today. Yeah. Well, when we come and visit you guys, we would love to talk with them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I hope you, I hope you do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I well, ask what, one more thing? One more question about tongues, if you don't mind. Um, so then how would you guys explain? Is it just psychological phenomena then because a, a person you know a, a well-intentioned continuationist who is in their prayer closet or in their home or wherever and and they be truly believe that they are speaking in tongues uh in the biblical tongues what what would you say uh first what would you say to that person and second what would you say about what they are believing would you do, are they just self self deceived 99.99% of it is learned behavior it's just a, an ability that you learn how to do and i tell people you can teach a canary how to speak in tongues it's just in fact some churches have classes on how to speak in tongues which makes no sense if that's something for which the holy spirit gives utterance why would you ever need to teach somebody how to do it but um but yeah it's, hey, it's Justin. Something, 
Yeah. I, I have a friend who spent years in the charismatic movement. He can drop into speaking the gift of tongues just like that. He exactly. just, start ram, just start rambling. He, he doesn't believe the gift is real, genuine, but he can, if, he, if you put him in front of a charismatic service, he could drop into that gift and start speaking in that way. And you'd be convinced that he was uh, just belonged in that charismatic setting. It's, exactly. it's just a learned behavior. I, it's obvious that they teach that. Uh, Sid yeah. Roth, I think you had on one of your clouds without water, Sid Roth talking and getting people on his show. It's supernatural, uh, oh. which is hard to stomach, by the way. Uh, you know, what does he say? I, 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 if I held a gun to your head, you could do yeah. it or yeah. put a gun to your ribs. And yeah. I mean, everyone's just statically gibberishing. That's yeah. yeah, it's just gibberish. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who used to be charismatic. I mean, they bought into it hook, line and sinker. And they spoke in tongues. It was part of their private prayer language, you know, their, you know, their time of private devotion with God and they would speak in tongues and they thought it was genuine, but it was just a learned behavior. And then God by his, the real working of the Holy spirit, God delivered them out of that deception. They're cessationist, just like we are card carrying cessationist. And as Jim said, uh, but they still retain the ability to speak in tongues. It's mm -hmm. just something they learned how to do. And um, it's kind of like riding a bike. You know, I'm, not that I can ride a bike, but, <laughs> but uh, from what I've been told, once you learn how to ride a bike, you never really forget how to do it. Um, even though they're cessation style, they can still do it because it's just a, a learned behavior. So that, and I'll, I'll throw this in there too. Pagans speak in tongues and in the exact same way that charismatics do. Mm -hmm. In the exact same way way yeah in fact if you took a if you took an audio clip of one and another you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. The one of them a, 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 hindu, a hindu kundalini and another a charismatic and you just played those two audio clips back to back in some case you can almost put them over top of each other and it would just sound like a charismatic worship service you wouldn't be able to tell that that one is a satanic or psychosomatic and one is allegedly the gift of god and i'd say if that's genuinely the gift of god you should be able to tell the difference between that and, and the work yep. of satan yeah that's right Absolutely. Well, so now that you guys are doing this movie, what, uh, how then can people support it? What are, what are, what are we looking at in terms of, um, uh, I mean, we didn't bring you on here. Just talk about tongues. What's what's happening. Tell us about it. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So we're, we have currently right now an active Kickstarter campaign. We're trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars. And I know some people will say like, that's, that's a lot of money when it comes, when it comes to, all the things that go into making a film, it's actually a very small amount. It's that $100,000 is actually a shoestring budget to make a quality film because there's a lot of things that we have to pay for, including editing and equipment and, and all kinds of stuff, travel to, to get interviews, all kinds of stuff. So uh, we're actually, trying to raise. I actually had someone tell me that we were asking for more money than Benny Hinn. <laughs> oh, 100. Benny Hinn spends $100,000 on lunch. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. On, on a night at the Ritz-Carlton, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, um, so we're trying to raise $100,000. We're at, as of this recording, we're at um, 39000 yep. uh, So we, we need about 61000 more. The thing about Kickstarter is if you don't raise the entire amount, you get nothing. Uh, so, so we definitely need support from God's people. If, if, if people believe that this is a film that should be made, I mean, what, what Tim's goal and mine is as well. And, and our, our partner, Les Lamphere, who, who uh, made a movie called Calvinist and another one called Spirit and Truth, that the three of us really desire that this film will be timeless, uh, that, yeah. that since, since it is about, uh, a biblical doctrine. We're hoping that it will stand the test of time that 30 years from now, uh, yeah. people will be able to look back on this film and, and still learn from it. I've learned so much. So, so right now we have about 12 hours of footage from you guys and the other people we've, we've already filmed. We're looking to get about maybe 15 hours more of uh, film before we edit it all down and crunch it into a two, three hour movie. We'll, we'll see how long yeah. it becomes. Um, and then, and then maybe we could do 
a study series with the rest of it. Um, but we, there's still a lot, a lot of stuff to do. And so, um, I mean, I think you said, Justin, you might uh, put the Kickstarter uh, link in the description below, right? Yeah, I will. Let me, and let me say something about that too. I, I, uh, I think I can say uh, I have never, as many videos as I've done on my YouTube channel, I've never asked anyone to donate to my ministry through my YouTube channel. My YouTube channel is not even monetized, although hopefully it will be, but all that money is going to go to support other ministries and other worthwhile endeavors. But at any rate, uh, I've done just a, two or three videos where I've asked people to help support um, a, a project. And, uh, and I, I, this is one that I would like to encourage people to support, because as you were saying, David, my hope and my desire, my prayer for this film is that long after we're gone, um, I would like this to be a, a, a tool that God will use to, to help an awful lot of people uh, and help them, help them to see these things rightly and help them to come into a, a greater understanding and appreciation and, and uh, rest in not only the inerrancy of scripture, but the sufficiency of scripture. And um, God will use this to bring people out of the charismatic deception, out of the dangers of evaluating their theology, about evalu evaluating their relationship with God through their experiences. And I'm not against experiences, but um, as long as they plumb with scripture, but, uh, but the, the charismatic movement bases everything off of, off of experience, very, very little of which is even valid. But uh, I won't, I think this will be a tremendous tool for a long, long time to come. And, and you've interviewed, you guys have interviewed not only me and Jim, but a whole bunch of other people too. And to your point, David, traveling around, especially now, <laughs> um, yeah. it, it is not cheap. Um, you're not, you're not using this money to go you know, spend a night at the, at the Ritz Carlton and, and drive <laughs> your Lamborghini around that this is, um, tell us a little bit about, tell us some of the names that you're interviewing, maybe some folks who you still yet, have yet to interview. And I want, I want people to get an idea of the scope of this project. Yeah. yeah. So Go we, ahead. We've, Tim. Yeah. We've, um, and I, I just want to add real quick that, uh, one of the criticisms I received was, why would you make a movie about this when there's so many good books already out there? And my argument is uh, we're li we live in a media age and uh, we've kind of seen in the last decade, some really amazing Christian documentaries come out that have been a blessing to the church. And those things kind of like Puritan works have stood the test of time over these years. I think movies when done right and done well, will stand the test of time. You might have to switch the format. Uh, so I might, you know, DVDs may go the way of the VHS someday, but we pray that this thing will will uh, will will press on past that, just like good books do. Uh, and my argument is also people don't read like they should, like they used to. Yeah, um, and they're they're glued to their Netflix. And if we can put something out there that uh, honors God and educates, um, that's what I want to do. I think we're it's a worthwhile endeavor. Um, talking about some of the guys that we've we've gotten, you know, we we met you at G three conference. Uh, I think we walked out of G3 with eight really solid interviews. The way we got Jim was God's prov God's providence played so just huge for me at the conference from the timing of everything to the Lord blessing us with uh, the uh, our, getting us a hotel literally across the street where we were able to film in their ballroom, which happened to be yeah. available, which it's never available, she said. And they gave it to us for two days for free. Uh, so the Lord was really at work um, in that. And, and when I came over to, yeah, when I came over to, to, to get uh, you, Justin, and, and, I, and you were kind of talking to some folks and Jim asked me about it. And, and next thing you know, I'm like, Jim, you got to come with us. We got to get you in this movie. Um, so the Lord yeah. was, was so, really at work in this. Yeah. I, I had no idea that Justin was even lined up to do an interview that day until you showed up. And and then uh, somebody asked about my book, God Doesn't Whisper. I explained what that was and was right along the line of what you're doing. And you asked me to come over to an interview. And I said, I, I don't know. I mean, Justin is in the shirt like he's wearing right now for this for this video, something like that with a suit coat on. And I was wearing this lime green polo that looks looked like I was I pulled off of a, 
of a job site by a roadside and I was the guy holding the flag and it's supposed to catch everybody's attention and keep them from hitting the workers. And, and I said, I, I don't think that, I don't think that this is really something that should be, I should be in an interview. And he said, no, no, come on in. And so we went and did that. So if you watch the trailer to this was Justin, you should post at the beginning or the end, you'll see Phil Johnson in a nice suit and, or a sweater vest and a, probably a shirt and tie and comrade and Bayway looks great. And Justin looks dignified. And then I show up looking like I walked <laughs> off of the road crew uh, in fact, I posted that that to Twitter and, and a friend of mine chimed in and he said, what is that shirt you're wearing? Is that a traffic cone? And that's exactly what it looks like. So I'm begging everybody to, to fund this, help us fund this movie so that we can get a different interview. And I don't look like um, a homeless guy. Well, yeah. Jim, Jim we, you know, God is sovereign and he was sovereign over your shirt choice that morning. Uh, so, he was. Uh, but if for nothing so, else, just so I could be the comic relief and the list of other good guys on there. So we're 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 uh, uh, we went and got Joel Beakey and David Woolen from Reformed Heritage Books. Um, we have a plan to go and uh, visit Brian Borgman, who's a faithful expositor. Uh, John Sampson, who used to be a former TBN host, who's now a Reformed yeah. pastor. Yeah, uh, Tom it. Schreiner. Uh, if if O. Palmer Robertson is available, uh, we're, I would love to get him. He's very. Uh, uh, Advanced matured age. he's he's <laughs> advanced in age uh but I, I would love to get that brother too uh he wrote a book on tongues um and uh did i did i say yeah it's sam waldron a uh, uh, renahan um there, there's there's so many and that, that's the thing is our, our list is just growing it's yeah. more and more and more and that couple who were uh, missionaries at, at jim's church we, we would love to, to interview them about their experience in the jungle. Um, so, yeah, there, there's a lot. We have a lot planned in this. The, sorry about that. Um, the amazing thing. Uh, are, you, are we still there? OK, yeah, sorry. Um, amazing thing is we have a guy working with one of our partners now in Les Lanfear who, who uh, he was an, an illustrator or animator for the Smurfs movie. Uh, so, so, and transformers. And so he, he oh. has a great ability to add, um, uh, po popular appeal to, to the films. That's not just, it's not merely an intellectual exercise, but it, it's, it's going to be something that, that is, uh, engaging and, and even entertaining and, and hopefully most of all helpful to the body of Christ. That's the reason we're making this is because we want to be helpful to Christ's body and yeah. we want to uh, be faithful to the truth about who God is, who the Holy Spirit is, and what he actually does in the world today. Yeah. And so we're, we're so, so grateful to both of you men for, for having us on and, and for helping to, to put this message out there. And we look forward to what God is going to do through it. Yeah. And, and I, I want to add, you know, I've had a few men that we've spoken to pastors who said, well, I, I don't really have what can I add to it? And my argument was you're a local church pastor and part and a big part of this film is what the Holy Spirit is doing today. Yeah. Uh, and so we want to hear from these men, these voices in the wilderness, if you will. No one might know who some of these guys are, but we pray that you do find out who they are and what they're doing locally in their churches um, because that's what we want this movie to reach the local church. Yeah. Yep. Indeed. Amen. Amen. Now, now David, just to clarify, there's not going to be actual Smurfs in the documentary, right? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe some dressed in lime green polos possibly. <laughs> right. That's great. Well, that, um, man, this, this is great. I'm, I'm excited about the project. And, uh, so the Kickstarter, I'm going to put the, the link in the description down below uh dear ones and you can click on that uh as of as of this recording th there's we have about three weeks left in the kickstarter program so um not to be urgent but i suppose to be urgent dear ones if if you can uh at any if you can help this project at all it would be so very much appreciated you will be a part of what i believe will be a very important work that by god's grace will bear a lot of good fruit for a very long time to come, a very long time to come. Yeah. So if yeah. you can uh, support, I, my ministry 
has supported it. Jim's on my board, so he knows that. So my ministry has has supported this project and any help we would we would very much be so grateful for. All right. Well, um, thank, guys, thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank y'all. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you, brothers. Okay. Well, dear ones, I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, hopefully, maybe whetted your appetite a little bit for this project. And and David, uh, Tim, and this will be expected release date sometime next year. Is that right? Yeah. Um, if if we can get funded, the hope is that uh, we will be done editing within nine months, and um, our, our editor will be editing as we're filming too. So we're, we're planning on going across the country. We have a, 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 a videographer also uh, overseas. I'm, I'm hoping that we can get some interviews overseas. Um, maybe Ian Murray and some of those guys over there um, that, that we don't have to necessarily travel there for it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, so the hope is that nine or 10, 10 months from now, uh, will be finished. And then, then maybe at that time we can all meet up again and do another video on how the movie actually went. <laughs> yeah, there we go. You know? All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Good thank deal. you guys. Yeah. Thank, thank you. y'all. Thank y'all. All right, dear ones link down below in the description. We so appreciate your help and uh, thank you for joining me until our next time together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of his Holy spirit be with you all. If somebody has the gift of miraculous healing, surely all he needs to do is to prove it. But let's face it, we've been battling with COVID and the so-called miracle workers went into hiding together with us. Cessationism is the view that certain miraculous gifts that stood as signs of an apostle, speaking in tongues, healing, prophecies, interpretation of tongues, gifts like that, ceased with the apostles. Cessationism has fallen out of favor because commitment to the authority of scripture has fallen out of favor. When you turn on Christian TV, you don't see expositors of scripture. John MacArthur or Steve Lawson, you see Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, Joyce Meyer, Paula White. That's who you see because that's the mainstream. Speaking in tongues, you're going to speak out of your spirit. Don't worry about what it sounds like. Our understanding of speaking in tongues must be guided by the scriptures, not our feelings. They were known languages that were capable of interpretation, and not everybody speaks in tongues. If God speaks, it must be infallible, inerrant, and authoritative. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. There's no longer the need for the gift of prophecy, speaking forth divine revelation from God. We have now the whole counsel of God. This word is the final word. The apostolic gifts have gone. They were never intended for our generation. We have everything that we need from the Holy Spirit today. It's hard to get anyone who's gone through that to come back and take a serious look at faith in Christ focused on the gospel rather than focused on these phony miracles.